All right, Cold War, over to my part one. I've decided that in order to sell more merch, I should do a face reveal wearing some of it. So are you ready? Here we go. Boom. New minimalist and Cold War merch available now. And get the new limited edition Churchill character pin before it sells out. With more characters coming in the future. Okay. Link in the description down below. The year is 1917. Good year. Fighting rages on the Eastern Front of the First World War. Both Germany and Russia are on the brink of collapse. Soldier, I need you to bring me this man. Got it. Found him, sir. What? No, not Len Nunn. Lenin, the Russian <laughs> communist. What? Why would I need a beetle? Lenin, the Russian communist. He was exiled to Switzerland. You know up. what? I'll do it myself. <laughs> Who wants to start a revolution? <laughs> Germans put Lenin on a train and sent him all the way back to Russia, hoping he and his mates would create an internal crisis. And create an internal crisis they did. The government was overthrown, and Lenin was in charge. Yeah. He immediately pulled out of the First World War, made the country communist, started a three-year-long civil war, got shot, broke the economy, caused a famine, and then he died. Cool. On his deathbed he said, Hey man, tell whoever's in charge of giving people jobs not to let that jerk Stalin become the next leader. <laughs> By the way, who did I put in charge of giving people jobs? That would be Stalin, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Stalin was a rising force in the Communist Party. He still had some opponents, but conveniently, all of them were arrested or disappeared. That is so that was lucky. And so Stalin took over. He has no Putin is about to be the longest running um world leader of like any current world leader. Uh when he when he wins this year's election, uh I think he's about to be the longest running. I, I, there's a couple small countries where I guess where they have like a monarch that might even but, like, if you count as elections in Russia, he's the longest-running elected world leader. I think he's going to lose. <laughs> uh, I did watch the interview. I watched the Tucker interview. I actually watched... Uh, I skipped around in the beginning, and then I watched the last half, because the beginning is a lot of history. Um, it's... Uh, I don't want to think about it. It's... Uh, <laughs> He's he's a weird guy, uh, Tucker and Putin actually. <laughs> uh, I think the 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 two things I take away from it is our our one um, his justification for invading Ukraine is a bunch of horseshit. <laughs> like he, he spends a long time on how the history of how that place is actually ethnically Russian and it's all part of whatever. And um, at one point he says it's like when uh, <laughs> it's like when Poland provoked. Hitler into attacking. <laughs> and I had to, I went and I double checked to make sure that was a real translation. I double checked. I, 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 there's a guy who's actually ethically Russian. He said he legitimately says it's like when Poland provoked, and like he says it unironically with no hint of, which is crazy. That being said, a broader takeaway that I had that I have to be honest with you about is that like, um. He's clearly 100% mentally there, thinks for the long term, and can talk at length about serious subjects and go back and forth, which is annoying. I think he's a bad person, but I'm like, I'm annoyed that like we don't have that standard of person. I, w I, I <laughs> neither of our presidential candidates could do anything close to that. could easily could have a two hour interview uh, that feels organized and like cogent. That's. Uh, that's annoying to me because I think this guy needs, you need to have a counterbalance because this guy is actively against U.S. interests. So I don't know. I, 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 I didn't like that, but, um, uh, yeah, I found it to be there. I, there's a really, really good, um, I, I forget the name. I'm sorry. I'll find it and I should let you guys, maybe I'll put it in marketing money discord. There's a guy who covers Russia, um, has a sub stack. Uh, smart guy. He analyzed it point by point, and it really gave me a lot to think about. And he basically said, I mean, you know, I'm boiling it down, but he's the equivalent of like Putin is is just giving his very Russia boomer take. <laughs> uh, it's actually pretty easy. Yeah, it's not like a, a planned orchestrated scheme here. You can pretty much take him at his word. He's been saying the same thing for 20 years. He has like a um uh. 
he's just a really history obsessed boomer <laughs> and um and truly believes and like he's also thinking about his legacy and like this is all part of his plan to unite all slavic people um you vote for putin i wouldn't vote for putin because of his active interest but i would vote for someone who had that level of um cogency um the pipeline stuff was also interesting uh only because like <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i think there's a real shot that the u.s or nato had a lot to do with the destruction of Nord Stream. i mean i think uh <laughs> should vote for green party this year no i'm not voting for green party bro i'm just telling you that i'm annoyed he implemented his five-year plans, which transformed the country from an agriculture-based economy to an industrial one. And like Lenin before him, he reigned with terror. Anyone who dared criticize or oppose him would either be killed or left to rot in the horrendous Soviet work camps. Then a short man with a silly mustache tried to take over the world, punched the Russians all the way to Moscow, and then the Russians, with some help from their faithful ally, the Winter, punched them all the way back to Berlin. At this point, being allies, America, the UK, and the Soviet... This is insane how much of world war ii is that battle um in terms of lives lost it's like it's like 17 million russians or something it's like more than everywhere everywhere else combined it's uh yeah i mean i think if you cut out i'm not sure the exact stat but like isn't it if you cut out everyone other than russians and germans losses it's still the biggest losses in history like it uh, Union were good chums. Anyway, they held yeah. a couple of conferences near the end of the war to decide what would happen. There's their quote where it was like, World War II was won with uh, American money, British intelligence, and Russian lives, which is an insanely dark thing to say, but like, it's just, it's really staggering the amount of difference. Uh, of, of Next, hey died. Stalin, after all your trials and tribulation, you must be pretty happy to be standing here in Berlin. Tsar Alexander made it all the way to Paris. Uh, hey, uh, j just give me a second. Hey man, I think something's up with Stalin. I know, right? What should we do? Shall I tell him about the bomb? Yeah, tell him about the bomb. That will scare him. So, we got this crazy new big A-bomb that can destroy an entire city in one go. Yes, my spies told me already. Oh wait. I meant to act surprised. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. He already knew. How? Um, am I sure I want to send nuclear secrets via unsecure public <laughs> coffee shop Wi-Fi? Am I ever? Is this how it happened, Dude, really? Use a VPN. <laughs> and speaking of VPNs, if, like me, you take internet safety seriously, wow. then you need NordVPN. NordVPN hides your online activities from outside intruders. So all of the Cold War could have been prevented if we just got NordVPN? That's crazy. That's crazy. Surf the and net factual. anonymously and securely. And it's simple to use. With just the click of a button, you can connect to a server halfway across the world, even allowing you to access streaming services from that specific territory. Say, for example, you wanted to watch a certain oversimplified video that for some reason has been blocked in your country. With NordVPN, <laughs> you can. It works seamlessly across PC, mobile, and tablet. Go to nordvpn.com slash oversimplified to get an amazing 75% off. That's just $2.99 per month with an additional month free for a limited time. So again, that's nordvpn.com slash oversimplified. Also in the description box down below. Now, where more were we? Stalin, more oh, Stalin. Yeah. Okay. Does the A stand for atomic or ass? Then America dropped their big A-bomb on Japan and World War II officially came to an end. Hooray, we won. Okay, so now it's time to establish the new world order. Stalin, you're in charge of Eastern Europe. Now, we want you to let them all hold elections. You know, one of the big reasons they dropped the A-bomb on Japan was because of an urgency to end the war before Russia got to Japan. Uh, because Russia was entering the Eastern Front and they did not want Russia to grab all that territory or like try to split it with them like happened in... So they, that's one of the reasons they dropped two A-bombs to just try to end the... Oh yes, of course, elections. And these elections will be free and fair, right? Oh yes, certainly, free and fair. Definitely free and fair. Communist, 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 communist. If that's not free and fair, 
I don't know what it is. Throughout Eastern Europe, Soviet puppet governments were established as a buffer zone between the USSR and the West, with Churchill proclaiming an iron curtain had descended across the continent. The relationship between the old allies was deteriorating fast. Over the next few years, the British intervened in the Greek Civil War to prevent a communist takeover. In Turkey, the Russians began demanding more control of Turkey's sea access routes, which prompted the US to send their largest battleship to Turkey for a friendly visit. After okay. World War II, Iran was now occupied by both the Soviets and the British, with an agreement to both pull out once the war was over. The British pulled out. Stalin was like, you know what? I think I might <laughs> stick around. All in favor of kicking Russia out of Iran? You want to know something? You guys suck. Pressure from the UN forced the Soviets to leave, and with the establishment of NATO, the Soviets had no doubt that the West was out to encircle and destroy them. And America announced the Truman Doctrine, in which they basically said, those guys are not cool, cannot be trusted, and we will do everything we can to prevent the spread of communism around the world. Many view this moment as the official declaration of the Cold War. Back in Europe, everyone was living in a post-apocalyptic void brought on by the Second World War. <laughs> Cities reduced to rubble, not enough food, it was terrible. This is great. The more they suffered, the more likely it is they'll turn to communism. <laughs> Dude, you're really messed up. What's wrong with you? My father used to punish me severely. America realized what was going on and quickly made a move. Under the Marshall Plan, they sent $12 billion to Western Europe for its economic recovery. The countries of Stalin's Eastern Bloc looked on with envy. Hey, Czechoslovakia, you want to come get some economic aid? Yeah, but I have to check with my mom first. Sorry, America. I can't come. <laughs> this was Sad. a full-on economic battle <laughs> raging between capitalism and communism in Europe. If the Western nations developed faster and better than the East, that would be a defeat for Stalin. So he set up his own rival economic recovery plan, which he called Comic-Con. And he also set up Common <laughs> Form, which gave him more political control over the Eastern Bloc. Holy shit, that's where Comic-Con comes from? All those fun Marvel movie interviews and things? That's from Stalin? I did not know. That's crazy. Uh, Ari's going to go there and cosplay this year. Maybe I can go there as Stalin. I'll be hell But Zero. nowhere did this economic battle rage harder than in the city of Berlin. Caught over 100 miles behind Soviet lines, the city had been divided up between the Allies, and the Western segments were still under Western control. That's funny. East Berliners could travel freely to West Berlin, see the economic prosperity, and think, hmm, maybe this communism thing ain't so great after all. I'm going to have fun tonight. You're home late. Oh, Stalin. I was just out with my friends. Friends? You stink of capitalism. You're out engaging in imperialist debauchery again. I swear, Ivan, I can't keep doing this. Stalin wanted the West out. So he said, hey, guess what? I'm blockading all of your supply routes to West Berlin. What well, are you going like to do about airdrop it? Airdrop in. I suppose we'll just fly the supplies in. All right, Truman. You in this round. The Berlin airlift was an incredible undertaking and a major success for the Western Allies, and Stalin ended his blockade of West Berlin. His aggressive actions worried the West, but not as much as this did. He got one! The Soviet Union had developed their very own atomic bomb. The USA no longer had a nuclear monopoly. The world now knew that if a major war broke out between the two superpowers, it would be more destructive than anyone could imagine. So it was comforting when Stalin came out and said that war between the Soviet Union and the West was unlikely. unlikely. Oh, wait, inevitable. <laughs> he said it was inevitable. Hey, you know who I haven't checked in on in a while? My good friend China. Whoa, China. what happened to you? What happened to them was a full-blown civil war that had been going on since 1927. The People's Liberation Army, under the leadership of Mao Zedong, successfully defeated the Republic of China, who fled to Taiwan. The now communist China and the Soviet Union signed a mutual defense treaty. This was terrible news for the West. But wait. There's more. After the Second World War, Korea was divided along the 38th parallel. In the north, the Soviets set up a communist regime. In the south, America set up an anti-communist regime. Both were led by very sweet-looking old men, but don't let that deceive you. They were both ruthless dictators, and both dreamed of reuniting Korea under their own regime. Now that he had the bomb, Stalin was feeling a little more cocky, and he finally gave Kim permission to attack. The north launched a surprise invasion of the south on June 25th, 1950. With Soviet aid, the north... It's crazy how close this gets to winning there's like a an interactive map you can look at where it goes like all the way down to like a tiny little patch and then goes all the way up to like a tiny little patch and then ends up back in the middle Korean uh, steamrolled through taking Seoul in just three days and replacing one ruthless dictator with another 
The UN were freaking out and quickly created an emergency force made up of troops from 16 countries to defend the South. The West still held Busan and made landings at Incheon near Seoul. They pushed the North Koreans out of Seoul, all the replacing cities? the ruthless dictator that had replaced the first ruthless dictator with the same ruthless dictator that had previously been replaced by the new ruthless dictator. <laughs> and the West then continued all the way up the Korean Peninsula. At this point, China was getting worried that the UN may just keep going. The US had sent this guy to lead the operation. After winning the Pacific Theater of World War II, General Douglas MacArthur's head was big and his balls were bigger. He reassured President Truman that there was absolutely no way at all that the Chinese would ever get involved. Meanwhile, half a million Chinese <laughs> troops were crossing into Korea. Nuke them. No. Nuke them. No. Ah, oh, come on. You're fired. The U.S. considered the nuclear option, but now that the Soviets crazy. also had the bomb, they didn't want to risk all-out global destruction. Yeah, good the call. communists pushed the West right back almost to the exact same spot they had all started from, and they ended up in a stalemate where they remained until both sides finally agreed to work towards a peace settlement in 2018. So back in America, <laughs> Americans decided they wanted a new president who would be tough on communism, so they elected famed World War II general Eisenhower, who is really hard to draw. It's 1953. <laughs> hey, Stalin. How you doing? Oh. He's dead. He had a cerebral hemorrhage and his reign of terror kind of came back to bite him in the ass because he had Excellent movie you should watch called The Death of Stalin. It's a comedy. It's got uh, Steve Buscemi in it. Death of Stalin is so, so funny. Please, if you want a, a good movie, it'll make you laugh all the way through. Learn a little history. 100% uh, watch that movie. Don't watch it with your phone out either. <laughs> Just watch it, bro. It's, it's good. Uh... He had imprisoned all of his best doctors, and those that were left were too terrified to treat him. The new leader, Nikita Khrushchev, called a meeting and said, Hey guys, you know how Stalin was imprisoning and murdering us all for doing basically nothing? Yeah, he was kind of a jerk. I'm really not sure how this is news to you. <laughs> Khrushchev went on a campaign of de-Stalinization. Statues of Stalin were taken down, Stalingrad was renamed, and Khrushchev announced that he wanted the Soviet people to be happy and would allow greater freedom in the Soviet Union. So how did that work out? Well, an uprising in East Germany was brutally suppressed, a revolution in Hungary was brutally suppressed, <laughs> and demonstrations in Poland were brutally suppressed. All right, Although he three. did finally allow some mild reforms. Back in the Soviet Union, he permitted more cultural expression, but then began banning stuff based on his own personal taste. Modern art looks like a child urinated on a canvas. Banned. Jazz music sounds like the feeling of needing to <laughs> fart. Banned. Your poetry is really depressing. How could anyone in the Soviet Union be depressed? You're banned. Khrushchev wanted the Soviet people to be happy, but not like that. Or that, or that. <laughs> Young people began enjoying abhorrent Western pop culture. Son, remove that disgusting Blue imperialist jeans, apparel at once. Shut up, Dad. You can't tell me what to do. Well, would you look at that? Turns out he can tell me what to do. The West had initially liked the cut of Khrushchev's jib, but world events soon soured relations even more. The two sides were spying on each other a whole lot throughout the Cold War. The KGB had spies and informants in nearly every aspect of Western life and government. So much so that whenever the US tried to send spies into the Soviet Union, the KGB were usually ready to arrest them on the spot. <laughs> Members of the Manhattan Project aided the Soviet Union in acquiring the bomb. Some American officials believed they were on the wrong side. I'll sell you three secrets for five million dollars. Okay. Go ahead. The Allies are digging a tunnel under East Berlin to tap your communications. There's an American agent living at this address in Moscow. And sometimes, when I'm home alone, I like to put on my wife's dresses, sit in the corner, and cry for hours. Very interesting. In America, fear took hold during the Red Scare and the McCarthy trials. American values imploded as fear of communism collided with freedom of thought and expression. And communist kind of became a buzzword thrown around to describe anything people... Good movie about this one. If you want an interesting movie with Brian Cranston, it's called Trumbo. It's about uh, real life screenwriter Dalton Trumbo who wrote like a bunch of amazing movies but was like, I don't know, pro-union and they labeled him as a communist and then he was blackballed in Hollywood along with other people for a long time. And uh, yeah, it covers the whole era but like with a fun, not fun, but like a movie arc. Not like an all-time amazing movie but it's a good movie, you should watch it. People didn't like yeah. Hollywood, communist. Your next door neighbor's dog? Communist. When the grocery store cashier asks if you need a bag when you clearly can't carry 10 tubs of bacon A's in your hands, Communist. But one area in particular where the US had an edge over the Soviet Union was in its espionage technology. In particular, U-2 spy planes flew across Russia carrying out surveillance from the skies. There was a nasty incident in 1960 though, when one was shot down and Khrushchev was furious. Who the hell is this? He's a high altitude weather <laughs> enthusiast who flew off course. Okay, that sounds plausible. Wait a minute. Why does he have a gun and a poison needle? Because... He's a 
very naughty high-altitude weather enthusiast. But much to America's concern, the Soviet Union appeared to be ahead in the space race. Everyone freaked out when Russia launched the world's first satellite, and then they actually sent a man into space. Even worse, there also appeared to be a missile gap in the Soviets' favor, and Khrushchev uh -oh. was so confident that he even allowed the U.S. to set up a technology exhibit in Moscow, attended by a certain vice president, Richard Nixon. Check this out. We have color TV. Yes, but we've been to space and can obliterate you with our massive nuclear arsenal. I don't have color TV. Check out this vegetable peeler. I think color Tensions TV is more increased valuable. further when both sides upgraded their atomic bombs to hydrogen bombs. And after West Germany was allowed to join NATO in 1955, Khrushchev set up the Defense of Warsaw Pact, strengthening the military ties between the Soviet Union and its satellite states. In 19... There's this game called Twilight Struggle. It's a board game for two players that takes like fucking five hours to play uh, that reenacts the Cold War from beginning to end. Uh, <laughs> it's an extremely complex and difficult game um, strategically and me and Stans used to play it uh, via Steam and <laughs> the thing about this game is like um, there are players who have played a gazillion hours of it that will just like every event of the Cold War is a card so there's like a Warsaw Pact card and like a fucking de-Stalinization card <laughs> and like you have to know when to play these events and so we would just go to like, <laughs> uh, twilightstrategy.com <laughs> and you'd go to like tear down this wall. Right. And it would be like, um, this is whenever you should play it, you know, late war Europe as the United States. And then we would kind of just follow this guide for every card we got. And so we figured out that me and Stans were just literally like, we were like almost like NPCs to each other. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Like I knew what he was going to do based on this thing. He knew what I was going to do based on this thing. We were just back and forth NPCing the fucking, there, there was, we, we were having so little personal choice in what we were doing. Um, and so then we stopped playing. Military ties between the Soviet Union and its satellite states. In 1960, Americans decided they wanted a new president who would be tough on communism, so they elected John F. Kennedy. The Soviet Union was advancing its technology, but it was also bleeding its coffers dry, and all of the money was going towards the military, not the people. Life under communism was still as hard as ever, and Berlin remained a thorn in the Soviet side. The contrast between the economically prosperous West and the struggling East was clearer day by day, and East Berliners were still able to freely travel to the West. Now, many of them were deciding to stay there. Millions defected to West Germany via West Berlin, causing Eastern factories to lose workers and taking a heavy toll on the economy. Nice Soviet leaders decided wall. this couldn't continue any longer. First, Khrushchev tried this. Leave West Berlin or else. Or else what? Or else I'll be really mad at you. Yeah, no, we're gonna stay. Listen, man, <laughs> West Berlin is ours, East Berlin is yours. That's just how it is. Kennedy felt pretty good about his show of American resolve. But wait a second, did you catch that? Let's replay it. East Berlin is yours. <laughs> Uh-oh, Kennedy just told Khrushchev that the USA wouldn't interfere in what the Soviets did with their section of Berlin. So Khrushchev came up with a new idea. <laughs> we're gonna build a wall, and it's gonna be a big- It's like a sitcom with roommates. <laughs> This half of the apartment's yours, this part's mine. And like they draw a big line in the middle. I mean, it's like, it's almost comical. This happened in real life as a solution. Beautiful wall, and it's gonna keep out all the Mexicans. To split a city down the middle is oh, crazy. sorry, it's gonna keep in all the Mexicans. On August 13th, 1961, Berliners woke up to find their city divided into two, with barbed wire and guards blocking the border between east and west. Over time, a wall was constructed throughout the city. Families were torn apart. Thousands would risk their lives escaping over the wall, and hundreds would die trying. To the despair of Berliners, the west were unable to do anything about it, but the wall did put on full display the failure of the communist system. As Kennedy said, democracy is not perfect, but we have never had to put a wall up to keep our people in. As part of the agreement between the two sides, U.S. diplomats were still allowed to travel to True. East Berlin. But suddenly, East Berlin crossing guards started giving them the business. And Kennedy was like, nah -uh. In October, the U.S. rolled tanks up to the crossing point at Checkpoint Charlie as a show of strength. The Soviets did the same, and the two were I've in a standoff. There. They stayed like I've that for 16 Charlie. hours, and the world braced for nuclear Armageddon. Thankfully, though, Kennedy called Khrushchev directly and was like, hey man, this As a true measure of the U.S. victory in this situation, you can go to Checkpoint Charlie today and buy a bunch of crappy merch. <laughs>
There's like a, a whole fucking ton of merch. You can get like a backpack and slippers and a shoe and a little snow globe. It says Checkpoint Charlie and like, uh, that's a capitalist victory, bro. This is getting way too hot. How about you back your tanks up by an inch and we'll do the same? Sounds good. Okay, how about you back your tanks up by another inch and we'll follow suit? All right. Hey, you want to do another inch? And they both very silly inched away from the apocalypse. <laughs> nice. You. Let's hope that's the biggest crisis of my presidency. <laughs> it wasn't. Part two, part two, part two. This video was made possible by Skillshare, an online learning community where you can learn just about anything. Cool. Support my channel by signing up using the link below and get your first two months for free. For anyone who thinks recent US history has never been as crazy as it is right now, allow me to present to you the 1960s, extreme cultural division, major political assassinations, and the closest the world has ever come to nuclear apocalypse. Shock but low and declining wealth inequality. Just saying. Yes, it had its problems, I agree. But low and declining until 1975, wealth inequality. Uh... By the CIA's intrusive methods for putting down socialism in Latin America, a certain Fidel Castro met with a certain Che Guevara in a bar in Mexico City, and the two of them decided they should grow some awesome beards and overthrow the Cuban government, which is exactly what they did. Cuba had been America's summer playground, and America didn't like seeing a communist regime being... And uh, not, I'm not naming that specific year, just late 70s into the Reagan era is when we started to rip apart all of our taxes on the rich, which allowed the rich to make higher incomes which allowed them to buy more things, which allowed them to grow their wealth at a faster rate than everybody else, which snowballs faster. And then, uh, you know, we've continued that pattern until today. Uh, set up in its own backyard. So the U.S. immediately began training up Cuban exiles to invade Cuba and overthrow Castro. However, as the day of the operation came closer, Kennedy wanted to conceal any U.S. involvement in the plan. So he massively scaled back American air support, and as a result, the Bay of Pigs invasion was a humiliating defeat for America. But Castro felt there was still an impending U.S. threat to his regime. Meanwhile, in the Soviet Union, Khrushchev had a lot of medium-range nuclear missiles that couldn't reach America, but they could if they were positioned, say, on an exotic Caribbean island off the coast of Florida, Hey, I'm a communist who hates America. You're a communist who hates America. You know what that means? We should fall in love. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to suggest you set your missiles up in Cuba. Oh, no, no, you're right. That's a better idea. Be still, my beating heart. On October 14th, 1962, a U-2 spy plane over Cuba noticed something strange. Sir, you need to look at this photograph. You're right. That's the cutest dog <laughs> I've ever seen. Sir. I was referring more to the Soviet missiles. <laughs> America freaked out as they realized what was going on. They were completely vulnerable and they had to act fast. They knew that airstrikes- Sorry, one quick pause. One quick pause. This is not related to geopolitics or the Cuban Missile Crisis at all, but it is about cute dogs. Ari and I were out to lunch today and she pulled up her phone, pulled open Discord and said, check out this. And it was It was the ACLU Discord, which I guess she's in. And it was a channel called Pet Pictures, Guppy's Pet Refinery. And it was Drop Spindle's Dog. That is a cute fucking dog. <laughs> Drop Spindle just posted that, I don't know, today or something? That's a cute dog. Little hat. So anyway, uh, shout out Drops Middle and uh, her dog Yodi. There's another picture, closer up. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of Maya like actually. It looks kind of like Maya. Yodi gang for sure. Anyway, I already showed me this at lunch. Okay, back to Cold War, sorry. Uh... So an invasion of Cuba would likely mean nuclear war with the Soviet Union. So Kennedy came up with another idea, a blockade. The US Navy announced it would stop and search any Soviet ships heading to Cuba and would sink any that did not comply. In response, the Soviet put its military into full combat readiness. Yikes. The US did the same and began drawing up plans for an attack 
on Cuba. Things were escalating fast, and both superpowers were getting ready for World War III. Emergency communications between the two sides broke down as Khrushchev rejected Kennedy's demands for the missiles to be removed. And for the first time in history, U.S. Strategic Air Command moved to DEFCON 2. DEFCON 1 <laughs> means nuclear war. The Soviets shot down a U-2 spy plane over... <laughs> Remember when Kanye couldn't remember whether one or five was the was the max one, so we just said we're at DEFCON 3 right now? <laughs> he just picked the middle because he... <laughs> yeah, DEFCON. He said DEFCON 3. <laughs> Cuba. A Soviet <laughs> nuclear submarine in the Caribbean mistakenly believed war had already broken out, and two of the senior officers gave the go-ahead to fire its nuclear torpedo. Thankfully, the third senior officer, this beautiful man, refused to authorize the decision. The U.S. finalized its preparations, and I kid you not, the day before the U.S. were set to decide the day and time for the Cuban invasion, Khrushchev was like, hey, you know if you just removed your missiles from Turkey, we'd remove ours from Cuba? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good to me. It was a bit more complicated than that, but at the last second, the two sides finally came to an agreement. Nice. Soviet missiles were shipped out of Cuba, and the world breathed one gigantic sigh of relief. Nice. Except for one guy, who was bloody livid. Phew! Let's hope that's the biggest crisis of my presidency. Unfortunately for him, his presidency was to end with one. Having nearly blown up the planet, a few changes were made. First, the superpowers agreed to a limited test ban treaty. Secondly, the Soviets ousted Khrushchev and replaced him with Leonid Brezhnev, who was a kisser. He liked to kiss. Both sides were deeply concerned at the prospect okay. of nuclear war. But still, the arms race raged on throughout the 60s and 70s. U.S. intelligence worked out that the Soviets' nuclear arsenal was not as powerful as they previously thought. But in fact, it was America that held the advantage. ABMs and MIRVs were developed, and the doctrine of MAD. If both sides knew they would be completely destroyed by a nuclear war, neither would risk starting one. But even without war, the world was already feeling the effects of nuclear weapons. In 1966, above the pleasant town of Palomares in Spain, a U.S. bomber collided with a tanker mid-air, and four hydrogen bombs fell and landed what? near the town below. It hasn't exploded, so I'm sure everything's what? fine. Whoa, boy. Uh, hey, I wouldn't eat that if I, I were know. you. I don't know. That's okay. crazy. What were you going to do today? Go for a swim? Yeah. Can you imagine if those exploded? That would be... That would have changed human history. Two planes collide and drop four H-bombs on the same town? The fallout would have been fucking... I wouldn't. Are you breathing right now? Yeah? Yeah. I wouldn't. It took the Americans two and a half months to find one of the bombs, which had gone missing in the ocean. This was the 14th time America had lost a nuclear oh, bomb since 1950. Nobody knows how many bombs the Soviet <laughs> Union lost. So sleep well tonight. <laughs> After Kennedy's assassination, Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson took over, and he inherited a developing crisis in the East, Whoopsie. Vietnam. Oops. Back in the 50s, the Vietnamese had kicked their French colonizers out once and for all, and the country was divided into two. In the North, a communist regime, and in the South, an anti-communist regime. Both were led by very sweet-looking old men, but don't let that deceive you. They were both ruthless dictators, and both dreamed of reuniting Vietnam under their own regime. So the North established the National Liberation Front, also known as the Viet Cong, to carry out a campaign of guerrilla warfare in the South with Soviet support. The U.S. sent advisors to help train the South Vietnamese to deal with the threat, but President Diem's brutal policies pushed more and more South Vietnamese to support the Viet Cong. And over the next decade, the situation escalated to a breaking point. America Surely feared the domino effect. That is, if South Vietnam fell to communism, would Cambodia be next? Then Laos? Thailand? Burma? India? LVJ had to make a choice between losing South Vietnam or sending in the troops. And so in they went. From 1965, America found itself in a war unlike anything it had ever fought before. Let's play Spot the Viet Cong Soldier. Did you see him? Of course not. That's because millions of young American men were drafted and sent to fight a ruthless enemy who used the thick jungle as its shield. It was nearly impossible to tell where the enemy was, or worse, who it was. And as a result, the civilian population got caught up in the brutal crossfire. The city of Saigon found itself under regular attack, and America launched a bombing campaign in the north during Operation Rolling Thunder. The Viet Cong used the Ho Chi Minh Trail running through Laos and Cambodia to supply the this campaign. Such a it was a long and brutal war, for... and I could never do it justice in this video. But in oh, terms of the Cold War, Vietnam was probably the biggest of many, many global conflicts that signaled a turning point.
Under the threat of nuclear war, the two superpowers began working to make their relationship more constructive, and as a result, their ideological battle shifted away from the potential of direct conflict and more towards attempting to influence smaller proxy wars around the world. In the Middle East, <laughs> the Soviet Union provided aid against Israel during the Six-Day War, and then again when the U.S. backed Israel during the Yom Kippur War. In Africa, the Angolan Civil War saw U.S.-supported South Africans fighting Soviet-supported Cubans. In the conflict between Somalia and Ethiopia, the superpowers interestingly switched sides as regimes changed, <laughs> and the U.S. continued fighting the spread of communism in its own backyard, <laughs> funding the famous Contra groups to fight the socialist junta in Nicaragua. Yeah, These proxy well. wars were fierce enough to begin with, but superpower intervention amplified the destruction and created alarming levels Jesus. of human suffering throughout the third world. And in Vietnam, that human suffering was all being broadcast back home by a good old television. Going into the late 60s, America was a changing nation. This became this. This became this. And this became this. The new slogan that was taking root, make love, not war. The majority of Americans did not approve of Johnson's handling of the Vietnam War. And in 1968, a silent majority elected law and order candidate Richard Nixon. As the Vietnam War appeared to be increasingly unwinnable and public opinion turning increasingly sour, Nixon made the decision to begin bringing the troops home and ended U.S. involvement in Vietnam by 1973. Two years later... That's a weird... Nixon was like the most anti-hippie person. It was like people were afraid of the social movements about Make Love Not War, and then they they elected Nixon as a shutdown of that. It wasn't like, I think that's a, he wasn't like the anti-Vietnam candidate, I don't think. I think he was like the anti-hippie candidate. <laughs> he was like the public order kind of candidate. Yeah, he was like the, um, uh, Nixon, I think uh, he was anti-Vietnam, but kept this so he could pull out later. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 again, I'm not 100% expert on Nixon's, uh, but in my mind, it's like Vietnam was such a turning point for a lot of things that were going well in America. Um, you know, I, I feel like it's it was it was just a huge blunder. It was just really bad. It caused like people to become disenchanted with their gut. Like there was a lot of, I was, I guess, a turning point for when government trust starts to fall. Um, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of things that like start to kick us down a path um, from Vietnam. And I think if we hadn't done it, you know, it's like, you know, we were making a lot of progress um, socially and economically to be more. Um, equal, and I think I think Vietnam is kind of the beginning of electing candidates that don't that turn against us. Uh, the South fell. The Cold War was now taking its toll on both superpowers. In Russia, a huge percentage of the budget drama, was still though. going to the military. People were still hungry, and they just didn't have access to the same lifestyle and goods as the West. And what did they have to show for it? They weren't even winning the space race anymore. Both sides needed to reduce spending in order to rescue their economies, and so both welcomed with open arms an easing of hostilities, otherwise known as detente. To improve That's relations, a card. Nixon became the first U.S. president to visit Moscow in 1972. That's a card, too. <laughs> and Brezhnev returned the gesture a year later. A number of treaties were signed, including the 1972 That's SALT agreement that limited nuclear weapons. Relations with China were even improving via ping-pong diplomacy when the U.S. table card. team went on a tour of the People's Republic. However, internally, China was still pushing anti-capitalist propaganda, which led to some mixed messages. Nixon even visited China in 1972, and it was a barrel of laughs. Today, the president walks among priceless treasures from China's golden age. Among them, a pair of ear stoppers used by the emperor to keep from hearing criticism. That's goaded. Nixon got the jokes, huh? I don't. I need that for chat, bro. Oh, here it is. <laughs> That's oh, actually great. Ooh, wait, it's nice. Everything was going great for Nixon until it was uncovered that back home he was being a very naughty boy and violating constitutional protocol. Oops. I'm announcing today my resignation as president and I'm passing the office to my vice president, Gerald Ford. Can you imagine that even like making news today? <laughs> 
I feel like our level of scandals have changed so like someone not even him someone uh, you know on his team broke into the DNC and took some documents they wouldn't even fucking I feel like this would be a one day news cycle uh like <laughs> board wow you mean in America that people can actually remove their leader when he breaks the law? Why not just rule by force? Where's the corruption? And my first act as president is to pardon Nixon. Ah, there it is. After the whole fiasco, Americans decided what they really wanted was just a nice, safe guy who wouldn't cheat on them. So they elected Jimmy Carter, and the two sides met in yeah, Vienna, where a, they signed yet another shame, strategic I think. arms limitation treaty. It's an honor, Premier Brezhnev. Likewise, President Carter. Please don't do that. But that's not to say there was no longer any tension between the two sides, because there was. Heaps of it. Once again, the Soviet Union put down further attempts at reform and rebellion in the Eastern Bloc. The Euro missile crisis saw new and improved classes of intermediate range missiles being deployed in Europe. In 1979, the Soviets thought it would be a good idea if they had their own Vietnam and invaded <laughs> Afghanistan to prevent a US sponsored Islamic insurgency. And in This video is dedicated to the brave Mujahideen soldiers <laughs> of Afghanistan, okay? Everyone, please stand and salute. There will be no backlash to this in the future. Response to these various crises, Olympic Games were boycotted. Conservatives were concerned that U.S. policy had become too soft. And in 1980, they decided they wanted a president who would be tough on communism. So they elected Ronald Reagan. And Reagan no! came in guns blazing. Concerned at the Soviet Union. What's the lore on that? Um... You should watch Charlie Wilson's War, another great movie I could recommend you with Tom Hanks. But uh, when the USSR invaded Afghanistan, it was like their quagmire Vietnam. They're all stuck there. Quagmire's from Family Guy. Giggity. And uh, and it was an expensive, costly, lives-losing war. And um, the U.S. was funding the Mujahideen soldiers that were that were like the equivalent to the Viet Cong in Vietnam that were fighting the Russians and making it like costly for them. And there would be, you know, like in Hollywood movies, when you'd watch them, it would have like dedicated to the brave Mujahideen soldiers in Afghanistan. It was like they were painted as heroes. Anyway, we funded them and gave a bunch of weapons. And then uh, after it was over and Russia pulled out, we just kind of abandoned it and didn't help or, or follow up on it. And um, funding that block of soldiers Anyway, long story short, ends up becoming like the precursor to Osama. <laughs> like, you know, th those people eventually turn against the West and have funding and then it creates a power vacuum in Afghanistan. And then uh, so, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, it's the precursor to the Taliban. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Union's human rights violations, he made a speech calling them an evil empire. And he also wanted to renew the arms race using technological advances in computing and lasers. He came up with the Space Defense Initiative, also known as Star Wars, which was basically a big defensive anti-nuke shield around the country. But a lot of people thought it was a pretty dumb it idea. Was. The Soviet Union perceived this shift in rhetoric big as the money. USA getting ready for war. And they were feeling especially threatened as their relationship with their communist ally China had broken down. Relations took a big hit in 1983 when the Soviets shot down a Korean airliner that straight into their airspace and it looked like the world was going right back to mid 20th century cold war tension but then Brezhnev I just want to pause and say that Reagan is you know there's so many reasons that Reagan is bad but I want to list a couple for you right now <laughs> that they don't mention in this video <laughs> for the you know I think nowadays it's very common to think like the United States runs massive deficits we we spend two trillion dollars a year more than we make and we just fucking print the money out of nowhere or borrow it this basically begins with Reagan. Like he is, he massively increases the government debt to, to afford all the things he wants to do without having to raise taxes. In fact, he cuts taxes, cuts taxes massively, especially on the rich, uh, which is again, the beginning of a drastic surge in wealth inequality that has continued to this day. We actually had, um, again, lowest inequality the United States has ever had is before Reagan got elected. Uh, positive direction, turn it all around. Uh, cut tons of government social programs that helped, you know, make the balance between rich and poor um, less and give like a safety net for the poor. And uh, just, yeah, just bad in a lot of different ways. Reagan really, really sucked uh, and was really popular because all that stuff works in the short term. You know, you cut taxes, you increase spending, you put it on the debt and there's no problem. But then, you know, 
later on you get inflation and you get uh, weaker unions leading to less wage growth and you get more and more wealth concentrating in the top 1%. And uh, yeah, he's fucked up. He's just a, he's a fucking, <laughs> uh, it's just a really, I, I just can't overstate how much I think he like has caused so many long lasting problems uh, that, that like many presidents before had the opportunity to do and didn't do. Uh, have got really old and died and was replaced by this guy who was really old and died and was replaced by this guy who was really old and died and he was replaced by Mikhail Gorbachev coming into office in 1985 he was the real game changer his f Это из-за него у нас в экономике бардак. Да благодаря ему у нас новые возможности. Это из-за него у нас политическая нестабильность. Да благодаря... I mean, you can't win the Cold War harder than this. <laughs> to get your biggest rival's leader in a Pizza Hut commercial? That's... That is a cultural victory. Полный хаос. Перспективы. Политическая нестабильность. Да благодаря ему... У нас есть Писахат. За Горбачева! За Горбачева! Sometimes nothing brings people together like a nice hot pizza from Pizza Hut. Can you imagine, bro? Can you imagine like Reagan in an ad for Borscht or something? It's crazy. It's a complete, total fucking victory, bro. Uh, insane. Okay. Philosophy differed a lot from previous Soviet leaders. He felt that the reason the Soviet system and economy was struggling was that it didn't allow the Soviet people to find satisfaction in their work because they weren't allowed to speak freely and lived in fear. Gorbachev wanted the Soviet people to be happy, but unlike previous Soviet leaders, he actually made the change happen. Within the first couple of years, he began the political movement for more openness and transparency and the restructuring of the Soviet political and economic systems. And cards. change very quickly took effect. People could criticize the government. They could enjoy Western pop culture, the media and interviewed Margaret Thatcher, but most importantly, the Soviet people could now enjoy Aww. Pizza Hut. All hail to Gorbachev. He also knew that the arms race okay. needed to end in order to rescue the Soviet economy, and a positive relationship with the West must be established. Constructive dialogue reopened and resulted in the INF Treaty, which saw all intermediate-range missiles eliminated, which was huge. Reagan's tone towards the Soviet Union began to soften, and things were looking up. But what would these reforms mean for the Eastern Bloc? For decades, the Soviets had been brutally suppressing any attempt at change. Now, would they be allowed? And that was the exact question on Hungary's lips right. when the Prime Minister visited Moscow. Gorbachev's response, he didn't necessarily agree with the reforms, but he wouldn't stop them either. He was prepared to let the Eastern Bloc choose its own future. This was massive, and the Hungarian leaders began planning free, multi-party elections. Poland followed suit and also held elections in June. The anti-Soviet party, Solidarity, won 99 out of 100 seats in the Senate. But not just that. In Hungary, the barbed wire border between East and West was- <laughs> That's, that's a bad, that sucks. <laughs> For Gorbachev, when you're like, all right, you guys can hold elections, all right, all right. <laughs> You know, maybe a couple of you won't like us. That's fine. We understand. It's 99 to 1. Was removed. <laughs> the Iron Curtain was unraveling. But not all Eastern Bloc leaders were happy. Notably, East Germany was still ruled by a hardline Stalinist, Erich Honecker. And many East Germans were still eager to get out. They had been trapped by the Berlin Wall. But now, they were doing the math. If they could travel to Hungary, and Hungary's border with the West was loosening, could they now make it to the West? That summer, East Germans decided Hungary was the latest top holiday destination. They traveled there in droves, and using various methods, tens of thousands crossed the border into Austria and the West. Honecker was furious, and Bloc traveled to Hungary, but that civil liberties train had started rolling, and it wasn't stopping. Thousands more flocked to the West German Embassy in Prague, where they stormed the fence around the embassy gardens, and a temporary refugee camp was set up. In oh, September, wow. deals were struck to allow the refugees to travel west via train. 
Back in East Germany, the people were running on a civil liberties high, and they wanted their next hit. Dissent was growing. Over time, demonstrations turned to mass protest, with plainclothes secret police officers doing their best to put down the dissent, but it had grown well out of their control. And worse, the biggest demonstration was yet to come. We're gonna put all of this down by force, right guys? Guys? Unfortunately, everyone had realized what he had not. This was bigger than them, and the entire East German Politburo voted him out of power. On November 4th, over half a million East Germans took to the streets of East Berlin. For many, there was still one big target left in their sights that damn wall. The pressure on the East German government was too great, and on November 9th, they made a bit of a chaotic announcement that the travel ban between East and West was being lifted. The change wasn't meant to take effect until the next day, and crossing guards still had orders to shoot on sight any who tried to cross. But that night, huge crowds gathered at the crossing points, and the guards were overwhelmed. Oh, shit. In an astronomically historic moment, after decades of family separation and travel restriction, the people were allowed to pass through. East and West Berliners couldn't believe it, and celebrated together throughout the night. Some even climbed the wall and began to topple it. The Iron Curtain had fallen, and a year later, Germany would be reunited. Elections in Bulgaria, a peaceful revolution in Czechoslovakia, and a violent one in Romania brought to an end communist authority in the Eastern Bloc. America decided it would be best if it just stayed away and let the change happen, as the anti-communist movement continued all the way back to Moscow. Gorbachev had given the people the freedom to demonstrate. Now, they demonstrated for an end to the communist single-party rule, and Gorbachev had to give in. For the first time in history, elections were held in which candidates not officially endorsed by the party were allowed to run. Ambitious rival of Gorbachev, Boris Yeltsin, led a growing democratic movement. Now things here get quite confusing, and the dissolution of the Soviet Union is a complicated topic. So believe me, this is oversimplified, but it went a little bit like this. The Soviet <laughs> Union was made up of a number of smaller Soviet republics, the largest- <laughs> She's just done like a huge unbroken fart sound for 15 seconds. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I was gonna make a dumb joke. It would be great if he just completely brushed over it of which was uh, Russia. Yeltsin got himself elected the president of Russia and began a struggle for sovereignty against Gorbachev and the greater Soviet Union. Communist hardliners were horrified at what Gorbachev was allowing, so they briefly kidnapped him and tried to set up their what? own emergency government. But Yeltsin and his supporters all gathered around the White House in Moscow and were like, no, we have a tank. So the hardliners had to concede and released Gorbachev. Wow, thanks Boris. That was a close one. No problem. And thanks to you for all the great freedom you've given us. Any time, pal. And just to inform you, I've used that freedom you've given us to go behind your back and make a deal with Ukraine and Belarus to dissolve the Soviet Union and set up the Russian Federation. In other words, you're no longer in charge. I am. Dude. So uncool. I get and so decades of tension and the everlasting threat of nuclear war finally came to an end as democratic governments were established in many of the old Soviet republics, and the world got along together forever after. Right, Wait, guys? I'm sorry, what day was this? Forever after. Right, guys? Came to an end as democratic governments were established. Holy shit! I was born. <laughs> oh my god! I'm part of history. I was born. Wow, I really thought this happened the year before. I thought this was a 1989 thing. Uh, I was alive during the Soviet Union. Holy fuck. <laughs> Holy fuck, dude. Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. Have you guys been right this whole time? Am I actually a fucking boomer here? Wait. I was alive during the Soviet Union, briefly. Uh, isn't that kind of cool though, in a way? <laughs> I was born and the Soviet Union gets dissolved. It's a, it's what, like a fucking 30 year cold war and I ended it the second I come into the earth? Coincidence, you guys think it's a coincidence. You guys think it's a coincidence the second I show up, <laughs> Cold War ends? That's interesting. That's interesting. Established in many of the old Soviet republics, and the world got along together forever after. Right, guys? Ba, 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 ba. Hey, this modern art thing is growing on me. Where can I learn to do that? Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning... Does it count at the end? Does it count at the end? Uh, that was...